10, Prince Harry. Brought in, off with something familiar, Prince Harry. I feel like this man needs no introduction, especially if you were watching the news, say, oh, around circa 10 years ago. The now married and humble prince was quite the partier back in the day. I'm sure our editors can find a safe for work image out there somewhere. A couple wild parties in beautiful Las Vegas had the royal family a little concerned. And when people say they're a little concerned, it means they're really concerned. At one party, he was stark naked. What? I know, right? It was weird. I kind of remember that, actually. And another where he was wearing a certain uniform from a certain time in Germany that would raise a few hands and eyebrows. You know what I'm saying? Thank goodness he's cleaned up, though. He's doing a lot better now, and he's married to the very beautiful Meghan Markle. Listen, Meghan, uh, if it doesn't work out, you call me. You and I, to get, we'll, we'll make it happen. You and I, a great husband, I, I'll, I'll help. Number nine, Prince Edward VII. The spoiled prince's spoiled prince. He's a man who had everything just given to him. The poster boy for silver spoons. Being the son of Queen Victoria comes with benefits. The second Eduardo was born, he automatically became a prince, a duke, and an earl of a couple of titles. In comparison, when I was born, it was a cold Canadian morning, and my family was watching through a glass screen at a brand new sweet babe. When one of my family members was holding a double-double said, why does he have three arms? I'm just kidding, I don't have three arms. But the point I'm making is that I, like many others, simply weren't born into the good stuff. We had to do this thing called work. I know, right? It sucks. Edward lived the life of luxury until becoming king in the early 1900s. The only thing I've been king of is the playground. And that's just because I was big and I pushed everyone off. This is my slide. Thank you, get on. Number eight, Prince Charles. All right, put your tinfoil hats on here, folks. We're going right into it. Okay, so Prince Charles, son of Elizabeth. It's the 1980s, life is good. Ladies formal wear has padded shoulders for some reason. Eddie Murphy is wearing red leather and Milli Vanilli is an acceptable art form and not a fever dream of the past. Good times. So Prince Charles does the most 80s thing ever and marries the most beautiful princess ever to grace us mortals. I mean, come on, look at her, she was gorgeous. So it makes sense that you'd wanna leave the most beautiful princess in the whole world after having two kids, right? Okay, but how? How do you leave Princess Diana? How about perhaps, maybe, kind of, sort of, might have uh, been plausible that Prince Charles uh, organized her car accident, hmm, which resulted in her passing. For him, Princess Diana was a warm up. Oof. For others, she was an inspiration and a conversation starter for middle aged women across the Midwest. Do you remember where you were when Princess Diana passed away? I do. I was eating cheese at the kitchen table. Number seven, George V. Honestly, this one could be number one on the list, but it's just so strange. Okay, so for those that don't know, George V, Nicholas II, and Wilhelm II were all cousins. Who were these royals I'm talking about? Well, these are the men who were in charge of their respected empires during the early 1910s. Why is George on this list? Well, in a nutshell, George and his cousins had the opportunity to de-escalate a very chaotic political situation in Europe. Old feuds were reignited by the assassination of Franz Ferdinand, and fingers were being pointed. Fingers quickly turned into guns, and hence, WW1 had started. Not a great situation to find yourself in. WW1 was kind of a bad one. Imagine your family having the power to stop a major global catastrophe and doing nothing. Nice. Number six, the Tsar. Being a prince turned king is hard. It's even harder to be a Tsar. I'd ask Nicholas II, but he ain't around anymore. Being a wealthy Tsar for a people that majority of don't have anywhere close to the same luxuries as the rest of Europe is even harder. There's a lot of things that can be said about the Tsar, especially his negligence for the Russian people. However, one event kind of sums up the whole thing. Imagine for a second if you were a poor Russian serf, working day and night for nothing, when all of a sudden a new Tsar says, Come on down, the folks. I know you're hungry. Come, enjoy some fresh hot pretzel and perhaps some beer. Since this was the best food a lot of people were going to have for a very long time, people rushed the grounds, and this stampede left over 1,000 people lifeless on the fairgrounds. The Tsar's response to his little strategic mistake? Party with the French royalty and not acknowledge his poor planning that had caused a major catastrophe. Oh, how many people? Hey, let's go party. Come, let's go. Hey. Number five, Alexander the Great. 
the son of Philip II and heir to the Macedonian throne. Alexander was the star child, and while it's true it may have gone to his head, he did make it work for him. The spoiled prince became king at 20, which is very young in case you were wondering, and during his youth would create one of the largest empires the earth would ever see. He was undefeated in battle and likely one of, if not the best, military strategist of all time. More than 20 cities were founded in his name, including the great city of Alexandria in Egypt. I don't have any cities named after me, but I do have a cool nickname though. Do I want my own empire? Sure, why not? The Cheddar Empire sounds pretty sick. Nice, the Cheddar Empire, I like that. Do I want all the naughty war related stuff that he did? No, I don't want that. I don't like that. I'm thinking more like a comedy empire, stand up tours, movies, and of course merchandise. That's how you know it's real folks. You get quotable t-shirts, that's how you know it's real. Don't sit up for your own farts, that's a, that's a good t-shirt. Some of you would wear that, I know you would. Number four, Suleiman the Magnificent. The prince turned sultan, Suleiman the Magnificent of the Ottoman Empire. Probably the most famous of all the sultans, and for having a really big hat. For real, that's a, that's, that's a big boy. That's a big boy right there. No, he's actually known for taking the Ottoman Empire that was good and making it great, plunging it right into a golden era. Successful military campaigns and some law reforms made him stand out. Speaking of standing out, it's his collection of ladies of the evening. This is the, this is the bad part where it stated that he had 17 personal ladies to service the mighty royal in his time of need. Yes, this did produce offspring, and yes, this did make things confusing for who is next in line. Number 3, Mansa Musa. Nothing says spoiled like being the richest man of the ancient world. Maybe even of all time, actually. A royal who rose to power and exploited his nation's salt and gold mines, which in return made him quite wealthy. Net worth is estimated to be in the $400 billion range, but it could be a lot more. We're not sure. I don't know about you fine folks, but when I get some extra cash in my pocket, just itching to get out there, I go head down to the mall. Sure, mall culture isn't what it used to be from the 80s, but I gotta hit up the gap, man. Good sales. But that's exactly what Mansa Musa did. However, he went to multiple cities, and when he went shopping in said cities, he spent so much money that he upset the economy of said city. That's just such a baller move, dude. Damn, all right, okay. Number two, William the Conqueror. The illegitimate child. A man who most likely would not take the throne since there were others in line. So what does William do? He says, nah, all right, I'm the Duke of Normandy. That's Scottish, but we're gonna go with it. I'm the Duke of Normandy, I don't have to take this. Thus began the Norman Conquest, and conquest William did. From the Battle of Hastings to all the other lovely things Williams did, he was the spoiled prince who didn't take no for an answer. What's the lesson in this one? See things through? Or being born into an intertwining European family is complicated. Sometimes swords can solve things. Number one, Mohammed bin Salam. Here's a modern prince for you, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. There's a lot that can be said, but all that you basically gotta know is that the family, the royalty, is very rich. Arab oil rich. Sure, the British royal family is treated like kings and queens with servants and whatnot, but these guys, whew, they live every day like that. And it is for sure more luxurious than old Blay. Dude's got money, it's rich. I'd love to visit though, it looks like a cool place. I don't know, we'll see. Kicking off the list at number 10, don't look. Okay, the saying you can look but you can't touch is pretty common and it does not apply to Filippo Maria Visconti. The Duke of Milan during the 14th century, okay, he rose to power after his brother Giovanni was taken out, if you know what I mean? He was, pew, he was balconied. You know, we get it. He was known to be extremely cruel and many were unhappy with him, so it didn't come out of nowhere per se. Doesn't mean it was right, but he was not a nice guy by any means at all. So now, Filippo had to take over come 1412. Filippo was better than his brother. He helped reorganize government finances. He got the silk industry up and running, okay? So he was doing things that were helping the economy. He ended up passing away like many years later, 30 years later almost, of natural causes. Nothing like his brother at all. But while he was in power, he never showed his face to anybody. He was a man of mystery, like that character from Game of Thrones that we never ended up finding out what happened with. He hid in his palace most of the time because he thought he was ugly. Sadly, he didn't allow anybody even close to him in the palace to look at him. I got a few zits and then I got a few lists to do. I don't get to hide my face. We're all humans, Filippo. It's all good, man. Just embrace it. It's cool. Pop it, see if it hits the mirror, you know? Have fun with it. Number nine, don't touch. Ah uh, yes, the prince that couldn't keep his hands 
off of himself, out of his pants. I'm not trying to say anything, but I'm trying to say some things. You get it? I'm like, YouTube, don't listen. Christian the seventh of Denmark, okay. He was a young, young lad, and he was spoiled, like many are on this list. He was comfortable with his body as well, and he was a lot of hormones, he was exploring, he was rich, he didn't have people to tell him no. He would often just have his hands in his pants, just hanging out in the middle of dinner, just passing food around to his family, alternating hands and pants to handing out food. What a little twerp, this is the worst thing ever. Now it's unknown, really, but historians believe maybe he had a mental disorder. Maybe, could be. Either way, don't touch the rye bread, Christian. Please and thank you. Number eight. Boot and Rally. This guy is one of the worst. Getting into more of the evil people here a little bit. Don Carlos, Spanish crown prince. The guy who just enjoyed being the worst human alive. Absolute piece of rubbish. Now it's been noted that he was born with a hunchback and one leg was shorter. He had the odds against him from birth, okay? And people often feel bad for him a little bit when this is mentioned. It's often like, oh, he killed a lot of people, but he had a hunchback. Yeah, don't feel bad for him. Don Carlos was made hero of the opera by his dad, Philip II of Spain, okay? He was set up to marry Mary Queen of Scots. He was fine. And he would still hurt people a lot because it was fun. He would roast animals that were alive for fun. And according to historians, Don Carlos once made a cobbler eat a pair of boots because he didn't like how they looked. He made a cobbler eat a pair of shoes. That's the most evil thing I can imagine. Number seven, cherry brandy. Okay guys, start sweating. You're gonna need your fake ID for this one. Prince Charles, okay, at just age 14, decided to walk his little age 14 year old legs to the local Stornoway Harbor Village pub. Yeah, I said pub, not arcade, pub. Kid pulls up a stool, he climbs up, you know, with little kid legs, and then he orders from the bartender in a soft voice, not a chocolate milk, he orders a cherry brandy. The prince was being discreet, but unfortunately a local reporter just happened to be sipping some crispy cold ones at the same time and overheard the young prince get his whistle wet. This was a huge scandal. I mean, obviously a child's like, hey, can I get a drink? Shake it, not stir. That's crazy. Headlines level scandal, obviously. I mean, look at the unwanted attention Malia Obama got for smoking the devil's lettuce while she was going to Harvard. You know, see what people focus on? You get it? In this case, fair. The kid's 14, good call. Save your lover, good eye. Number six. Rudolph the second. Okay, this one is not the red-nosed reindeer. This is the second one. This one's a little bit different. The Holy Roman Emperor from 1552. He was known as a collector. He liked to collect things. Some princes collect stamps, I've mentioned before. Others have a live dodo bird. A little different. Step your game up, I guess. I don't know. He was super into the arts as well. He was into pretty much everything mystical and wonderful. His castle, yeah, castle, was also home to lions, tigers, and orangutans. Yeah, good luck sleeping. He also collected human artifacts. So that's, yeah. Welcome to MTV Cribs. Don't mind the jar of eyes. Come on in, here, check out the sofa. Don't step on that lion's tail either or else it'll eat you. Watch out, careful, watch your head. We're in a castle. What a mess. He's quite important in history though. He supported the scientific revolution. He also poured tons of money into astrology. So next time you read your horoscope, remember it's Jaw Jar Johnny over here that's responsible. I'm a Libra, just so we know. Are we, are we compatible? We'll talk in the comments. Number five, not immortal. Kin Shi Hang was trying to find the key to immortality, and in doing so, he met his fate. Ironic, I'll say it, it's ironic. The first emperor of China caught wind of old myths, myths about immortality and these three spirit mountains in the sea. And living on these mountains were these immortals, like a Marvel comic book. It's crazy that he actually thought this. So he searched for what's called the elixir of life. Yeah, like something from Legend of Zelda. Sounds pretty interesting. He once sent hundreds of young men to this Penglai mountain and they were sent to retrieve this elixir. They were sent to find it. Now, they never returned. Maybe it has something to do with the fact that the contact they were supposed to meet was a thousand year old magician. They're like, he's not here. Weird. His next plan was to get his own alchemist to make immortality pills, but unfortunately they were made of mercury. So those pills were the cause of his death. Don't eat pills or talk to alchemists. We don't need those guys anymore, I don't think. Number four, King Ludwig II. This young lad has numerous castles built for him to resemble fairy tales. 
How neat. Nobody really knows why he was so obsessed with castles in the first place, but he had the budget to make them, so now he's important and remembered in history. He designed them after his favorite fairy tales. I'll be honest, I kind of love this. Ludwig was only 18 when he later became the king of Bavaria in 1864, and then he had the green light to do this wild teen DIY project, making castles, as in more than one, each of them inspired from romantic literature and his early days with the family at the opera. Wow, his early days at the opera. Must be nice, Chris. I made pillow forts growing up. Does that count? I don't know, Kim was a dreamer. So are we all. He would spend his nights in one castle looking through a telescope at his other castle being built. People are hauling bricks up a spiral staircase and he's just watching from his bedroom like, mm, yes, careful, lift with your legs, mm. He should have spent less time looking at fairy tale castle blueprints though because two years later in 1867, he went through a horrible defeat. That's mostly why he's known. Castle boy. Number three, Farouk I, the youngest son of Egypt's first king, Fahd I. He was born in 1920 in Alexandria, and in his early days at school, he couldn't concentrate. The king sent him to England to hopefully find a new way of teaching and learning, something that works for him, but still no luck. Once the king ended up passing away in 1936, you know what's up, Farouk ended up getting the throne but also he had so much more property. He had hundreds of fancy cars, 75,000 acres of land. He had everything, but still he felt like he needed to take more. Classic. So at just 17 years old, he would slam a bunch of eggs for breakfast, wash it down with bottles of beer, like 30 bottles of beer, just nutritious and delicious in all the wrong places. And he was one of the biggest hoarders ever, and he loved to steal. They go hand in hand, hoarders and thieves, I guess. He had thousands of shirts, which is so funny. Just this guy is, hey, look at my cars and also look at my shirts. This is Animal Crossings, apparently. He had 50 diamond studded walking sticks for some reason, and like a prince, he too collected coins. One of the most bizarre things of Farouk was that he liked to steal. He pickpocketed Winston Churchill once. Guy's insane. Number two, no fun. This is the worst of the worst people. Murad IV, Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. The guy banned coffee like a piece of shit. He was born in 1612 and for the most part his mother was ruling through him like some kind of Game of Thrones plot because he was so young, he didn't really understand it. He didn't know politics, he was just like, chocolate milk. And when he got a little older, he put forth these laws punishable by death, because why not, in order to get things back on track, make himself more, you know, of a leader, I guess. So he banned coffee, tobacco, and alcohol. Just no fun, absolutely. Have fun at prom, I guess. He would actually disguise himself as a civilian at nighttime and wander around aimlessly in hopes that he would catch you drinking a coffee in the middle of the night. And then if you were caught, God forbid you're having a smoke break after work, you weren't arrested, you didn't get fined. Rod IV himself would just take off your head right there in the streets. And then your head would just roll down a road because you had a dark roast. What an asshole. And finally coming in at number one. Caligula. Running the clock back to 12 CE, Gaius Caesar, AKA Caligula, AKA the Roman emperor at the time, apparently he was close with his horse. Some say he was a little too close, but I'm not gonna get into that. I had two dogs growing up, I would rather die for those little piggies, all right? And if I had the money, yeah, I'd probably make them a house as well made of marble. He gave his horse a marble stall and it got to the point where they were so close, they were homies, they were so tight, that Caligula was about to appoint the horse to the high office of council but he was taken out. He was, a, so I can't say the word, but he was pew from afar. Imagine if he lived and this happened, what would those meetings look like? Or rather, what would those meetings smell like? Count me out. 